one of the toughest things in doing these stories is coming up with villains. You know, the hero is easy. Once you've created the hero, you've got him, and you use him in every story, and you know him. But you've got to come up with a new villain in almost every issue. There's a long history in the annals of literature and uh, entertainment of bad guys who are wonderfully attractive in various ways. If you think if Spider Man is the geek gone good, Octavius is the geek gone bad. I, I wanted a scientist. And I thought the name Otto Octavius sounded pretty good for a scientist. So I wrote that down. Then I said, well, if his name is Octavius, and I had him working on radioactive material, and that can be very dangerous. So there was a big glass shield, and he would work outside with little tentacles, and they would operate the radioactive material. And the glass shielded him from the radioactivity. But those looked like tentacles, so I thought his name is Octavius. Maybe I'll, I'll have all the students call him Dr. Octopus. He's a wonderful character. He's, he is so offbeat. I mean, the fact that he's a scientist, and he was a, he was a little dumpy. When we, when we were doing him, we made him a little bit overweight. He was more like an Edward G. Robinson type. Uh, with a little girth, and it was certainly a very distinctive kind of character. Here's a guy who wasn't out to rule the world or anything like that, but he had these tentacles grafted onto him accidentally. He could climb up the wall of a building with him, he could crush things. So he was a worthy adversary for Spider-Man, which is a hard thing to find. Doc Ock is arguably, you know, it, it's got to be one and two with, with the Green Goblin, you know? And, and it, it also depends on what era we're talking about. You know, if, if you're talking about the 60s, it's definitely Green Goblin. If you're talking about the 90s, then you're talking about a character like Venom or Carnage, uh, a whole different sort of breed of villain that, that, that came up. But I would say arguably when it comes to classics and, and you know, in the long haul, it's, it's Green Goblin, Doc Ock, neck to neck. When you create a character, you want to make it as different from the normal as possible so that he's distinctive. If you see a silhouette in the dark, you know who it is. That's the way to define characters. He was just a crazy old man uh, originally, you know. He, he went nuts and uh, his scientific ability made him angry and uh, then he became greedy. So, But we gave him to mention and that was, that was a, a residue of continuity and bringing up new angles on a person the second and third time around. There is sort of the, the, the father-son relationship with Peter, but I think what really makes Doc Ock very, very cool is the fact that his upbringing, his life, is very, very similar to Peter Parker's. Here was someone who also received extraordinary abilities by way of the uh, prosthetic arms, who also had a choice to make. And I think that they recognize that about each other and that's part of the dynamic between them. And to me that sometimes makes for the best villains because they're almost exactly the same person as the hero except one deviated left, one deviated right, and it's just a slight turn. And uh, I think Octavius would like to have been recognized for what he was and what he did. And the more he fights to be recognized and the more he fights uh, for some measure of credibility, taking the wrong tactics and doing so, the worse the world looks at him, the more determined he gets. So it's this really bad cycle of, of constant revenge and the longing for uh, appreciation. And before you know it, you know, life takes you into interesting places. And that's, uh, and then when these two characters, you know, collide together, uh, it deals, uh, it makes for some great fireworks. We set our minds on Doc Ock from the get-go. Uh, there's really, I think there was a two-second conversation about maybe a goblin continuity or it was too early to go there and wasn't really interesting enough at this point. Dark Ark is fantastic, but, but what do you do with Dark Ark? How do you, how do you develop this character? In the casting of Alfred Molina, you start with someone who's immensely likable. And, and that's what you want in any great villain, is you want him to be a human being who has dreams and desires and, and flaws. And he gets carried away in the service of something that he thinks is positive. Like, you know, it, it is ultimately his own hubris. The real crime would be not to finish what we started. 
will do it here. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. Nothing will stand in our way. Nothing! Please welcome our very own Dr. Octavius, Alfred Molina. My familiarity with, with the with the Doc Ock character really wasn't very uh, thorough because I mean, when I was a kid, I was very you know fond of uh, comics and particularly the Marvel comics. I was always a big fan of Marvel comic characters, much more so than the DC characters because even at that young age, they seemed to me to be much more interesting. When I when I got the job, I I started checking out some back cup copies and you know uh, realized that in fact. Um, Doc Ock changed his look very much over the years, as, as you know, depending on who was drawing him. But the one thing that was very, very constant in the characterization of Doc Ock all the way through the various stories from the mid 60s right through to now was that he always had a really kind of good sense of humor. There was always something a bit more, a bit kind of sharp and intelligent about him. He wasn't just a a kind of brutal bad guy, so like you know, he, he wasn't just you know, he, he kind of had a he had a bit of class to him, you know. I used to like, I like that. I suppose one anxiety I may have had at the beginning was how much of this was going to be an actor's job and how much of it was going to be essentially just was I just going to be a cog in a much much bigger machine. But as I as we started work, I realised of course that Sam never loses sight of the human elements in, in the job. I mean, he, he's not one of those directors that suddenly gets completely obsessed with the technical stuff and the special effects and the CG and all that stuff and then completely forgets about the flesh and blood that's, that's in there. Dark Ark, to make him the way we are making him for this movie is a very complicated process. Uh, it's probably one of the more challenging characters. Neil Spisak, the production designer, and John Dykstra, the visual effects designer, and myself kind of worked together uh, on developing the image of Doc Ock. From the beginning, we put one of our production assistants, Aaron Scully, in kind of a harness with normal, uh, I don't I think they're like washer and dryer black tubes coming at him. You know, a guy standing in the middle of a room with dryer hoses coming off of him. Just to start talking about something as wacky as, you know, the guy has four arms growing out of his back. So talking about proportion and length and balance and what would he have to do in order to walk and how would he get up on his haunches and just the sort of things that you would think are simple take a great deal of thought. This is a great short length and they can even be shorter. Of course, okay, I don't think we have to mock up anything shorter right now because we know that they're going to eventually, in the story, through CG, fold up, collapse, and become part of his back situation. This one looks small to me, this claw. Yeah, it was just a, yeah. I mean, we did this last night and this morning. This one just is, to get the length. This one looks, uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's a little, maybe a little too big, maybe somewhere in the middle, as far as the victim and cat. Although I'd love to grab somebody by the head. head. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we need bigger feet, um, lower ones and smaller feet than the top ones. But I'm afraid if we have big feet on the top ones, we won't have the dexterous quality we've been talking about. We looked at the first um, illustration of Doc Ock, and it kind of had a very crude look to it. And we wanted that to be a little bit more sophisticated and where it would look like it was built for a specific purpose of a very fine mechanical instrumentation or movement or um, something that would be used in a lab, which that first one didn't kind of give off that appeal to. <laughs> the one person that I need to acknowledge hugely is the illustrator that I work with in London called Paul Catling. And he and I worked together in London and then brought our drawings to the table here in Los Angeles and they were much liked. The original drawing of, of Paul Catlings is the one that everyone gravitated to in terms of style and feel. And actually I think the end ended up not exactly that, but there were a lot of things that were similar to that drawing. There was a decision 
right at the beginning that the actor and the director wanted practical puppets to work with so that when they were intimate, if the tentacle was picking up a cigar and putting it in Doc Ock's mouth and then lighting it with a match, they could do that with puppets in close with the puppeteers off screen so that one, the actor had uh, the tentacles to interact with, to perform with, and two, uh, we didn't have to make CG tentacles for every single shot. Plus, it gave the director real things to interact with. The faster snap works for me. Okay. Snap and open, quick. Okay. Something right. like the two mm -hmm. shot of what he's done, right. right? And action. As we went further forward, John Dykstra, with his responsibilities for the, for the uh, computer design, and um, Neil Spisak, with his responsibilities for every set on the movie, gradually it was left to the, uh, the costume designer to kind of follow it through. So I've had this wonderful chance to work with model makers and uh, engineers and uh, robotic experts and all these wonderful people at Edge Effects, uh, Steve Johnson's company. When we first got the call for it, it was like, wow, Spider-Man 2, that's going to be a really big hit. That, what, a, what an honor. How cool was that? But then the reality of it hit that this is going to be probably the most difficult thing we've ever done. And it probably was. Um, it wasn't like I read the script and thought this stuff is pretty difficult, this is going to be a really, really big challenge because there was no script. There was no script until months into preparation. So that actually was probably one of the more daunting aspects of it. We literally started building, designing, and basically kind of just guessing what we might need for this character to film this movie. We prototyped everything. We didn't really have a blueprint of the, the vertebrae of each tentacle should be this size, the tentacle should be this long. We kind of just made it up as we went along and did pass after pass after pass and got approval from the production as we kept going and we kept doing it that way. There's various stages. There's the corset, which has to be worn basically for protection. Then on top of that goes what we call the girdle, uh, which is what the tentacles are attached to. And that girdle is in two parts. There's the back girdle and the front girdle. We've got the big metal version, we've got, we've got a rubberized version. Then we've got other things like there's the big spine, this kind of spine. The, the tentacles, uh, when all four of them are on, the whole thing weighs about 100 pounds. At the initial phases of design, there were lists of things the tentacles had to be able to do. And um, it was just a challenge, a huge challenge. I knew that the performance would be what would make or break these pieces. So we hired from the very beginning, even the beginning of the test phases and the design phases, we hired a contingent of puppeteers here at the studio so that we could work out the performance and the attitude and the character of these tentacles along with how we were going to build them and how the animatronic functions would work. Eric Hayden was the puppeteer, lead puppeteer, and also, as very fortunately enough, was the person who was in charge of the shop as all the research and development was taking place. So at Edge Effects, Eric Hayden was there from the initial meeting of how it was going to be put together to actually getting stuff on film and, and controlling the movement of the puppets, determining the movement, directing the um, puppeteers, and working with puppeteers in a very strong way. Before tentacles even were made, we had created uh, these foam rubber tentacles that, that were held up by sticks and and manipulated and, and had wooden claws that opened and closed, nothing else. And we did a test shoot where we blacked out a room and the puppeteers wore black and they, they operated these tentacles attached to a stand-in, to a stand-in actor. And man, it looked cool. I can't pick out one shot in particular that really worked. It was just the simple fact that the puppeteers disappeared into the background. These things were alive, and they were doing stuff. They were grabbing objects and putting them places, and they were four separate entities attached to this one man. And I think everyone at that point felt, you know what, this is going to work. The controlling mechanisms that operate the death flower would normally necessitate up to three people to operate one claw. Well, we needed to square down our footprint on set so we didn't have 
20 million puppeteers on set. And we generated what we call the throne, which is this uh, controlling chair that an operator can ride in and his feet operate some of the jaw articulation and his hands can operate. Uh, and that means that we get everything pared down into one efficient throne. The design of the, of the Death Flower was uh, arrived at uh, due obviously to a lot of different considerations, but the main thing that we were looking for was um, ability to express a lot of different kind of emotions or moods or whatever, ranging from a kind of an attack mode, which uh, can get into something like this, to uh, a kind of a wounded mode, uh, which is something like that to a kind of, um, you know, aggressive or focused mood, which is something like this. Um, and uh, there are a lot of different, there are a lot of different permutations of that. Um, that's something we call a ball, which would theoretically be for like punching through walls, things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> so the design process of the, of the movement of the death flower was, went through a lot of different iterations, but um, basically once the kind of uh, trilaterally symmetrical uh, concept was agreed on and the segmented uh, leaves of the flowers, of the fingers, um, I set about basically trying to make, uh, to design the joints for sort of maximum movement and expressibility. So we really had two companies here under one roof. We had the performance aspect and the engineering aspect going along following simultaneous paths. And that actually really, really helped when it came down to getting on set and Sam being able to direct these things. Because truly that's what it was. Sam was directing these tentacles like a character. In peak performance with all four tentacles going simultaneously, there were 16 puppeteers working. Each puppeteer had a very specific job. Each tentacle takes four people to operate. The performance relationship between what our team of puppeteers did in relation to what Alfred did on set in terms of his movements being uh, led by our movements or our movements being led by his movements started off in a very slow and careful rehearsal environment of pacing it out. What does it feel like to make this eight foot long arm strike from your back and look like it's coordinated from your own muscles. Uh, so that it started off almost as a movement exercise trying to to marry the movements of all the people involved in making that tentacle strike. We realized of course that this was a, a crucial and integral part of the characterization and we had lots of long and, and detailed rehearsals with the puppetry team. Anytime you ever feel, I mean, they're so <laughs> totally safe to touch it or, or play with it. Cool. That's cool. Go. Three, two, one, strike. Cool. Ready and go. And on go, we're gonna look to the right. Ready and go. How does that feel, Fred? And yeah, control, a lot better. And go. A lot better. Okay, cool. One, two, three, right there. Four, five, right there. Five. Okay, yeah, those so last the couple. Exactly. So last couple of steps, it's like it's like I'm it's like I'm being held back. Okay. We tried to make the tentacles practical whenever we could, um, because clearly that was always the mo the most effective way of doing it. When they're real, they're real. There's no two ways about it. But you know, there are certain shots that you know obviously that can't be done, and so we had to have them you know CG'd in at a later date. And I and I had to kind of like mime them in a way. I imagine they were there. One of the things that's tough about the character, Doc Ock, is to make him perambulate. Walking on his own feet is one thing, and he has to act as though he's carrying 60 pounds of tentacles. When he's wearing the puppets, he is carrying 60 pounds of tentacles, so that's not too tough. When we take the tentacles away, the practical ones, and we start making virtual tentacles, his weight is supported by those tentacles. He's carried by those tentacles. So we've made a device that actually harnesses to him and moves him through space as if the tentacles were supporting him. And that's the Doc Ock walk rig. Doc Ock walk rig. There's bound to be a toy in that someplace. It's on a track and it flew uh, like 20 feet above him and all these wires hooked to him and, we, and through a computer, we were able to pull the wires in different, different ways. And it was just like, it was like a computerized 
um, we were the we were the puppet masters. Peter Parker and the girlfriend. Apart from it being a bit tedious and sometimes difficult, I quite enjoyed that the technicalities of it. I quite enjoyed the technical problems that had to be solved. I, I enjoyed being part of that process. You know, it's a funny thing. Most comic book movies kill off the villains. In the comic books, I rarely, if ever, did that. I was more miserly. I didn't want to get rid of a good villain. I wanted to save him and use him again. I mean, how many times have you seen the villain sort of fall off a cliff and you sort of look over, he's gone, he must be dead, uh, only to return a year or two later. I mean, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a hallmark of storytelling, especially heroic style storytelling. Readers and audiences build up a feeling for, for the characters, if they're heroes or villains, and it's always fun to see them again.